We hear a lot of perspectives on the Mankind Podcast. Inclusion of a guest is not an endorsement of their views, and the opinions expressed here do not always represent the mission or values of the Mankind Project USA. Looks like the rain has gone. Hey everybody, it's Boysen Hodgson. Welcome back to this episode of the Mankind Podcast, Mankind Podcast, where we are setting out to prove that there is indeed more than one way to be a man. And I think we're doing a pretty fine job. Today, I get the honor and I'm excited to introduce you all to Tina Alexis Allen. Tina, why don't you say hi first? And Hello, I'm so happy to be here today. So impressed with what you're doing at the Mankind Project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Tina reached out because she was sharing a project, which we are going to be talking about um, in depth that she's creating a short film. But Tina Alexis Allen is an actress, a writer, producer, director. She's the youngest of 13 kids and a tomboy at heart. And in addition to winning a gold medal at the U.S. Youth Games, Tina received a basketball scholarship to Powerhouse Maryland. Later, she earned an MBA in marketing and worked as as an executive on Fashion Avenue, 7th Avenue in New York City. Some soul searching led Tina to leave the fashion world to pursue a career in Hollywood. Her coming-of-age memoir, Hiding Out, which we're going to be spending time talking about today, published by Harper, is currently being developed for the screen. She's also currently in production on a feature film, Park Avenue, co-written by director Gabby Delal and starring Fiona Shaw. Tina is also an executive producer on Park Avenue. Her other projects in development include an hour sports drama co-created with Michael Frost Beckner of Spy Games fame, feature film based about two sisters growing up in a segregated Baltimore in the early 1960s, and a home makeover series focused on inclusive and accessible design with social impact. Holy mackerel. I didn't know a lot of this stuff. Tina has been celebrated as a writer for stage and screen and for her diverse range of acting roles in theater, film, and television. Famed acting coach Susan Batson, who was an acting coach for Oprah and Nicole Kidman and Lady Gaga, among others, described Tina as a true chameleon capable of playing anything. We're going to kind of touch on that today, too, when we're talking about hiding out. As a breakout star on WGN's record-breaking series Outsiders, Tina plays Shern, a fiery member of the Farrell clan alongside David Morse and Ryan Hurst, currently streaming on Hulu. Tina can also be seen in the Lifetime movie 12 Desperate Hours, directed by Gina Gershon. For her acting work in The Breakup Notebook, Tina was nominated for a GLAAD Award alongside Jane Lynch. For the stage, she wrote and performed a 12-character, one-woman show called Irresistible, lauded by critics as rivaling the work of Lily Tomlin. In addition, she produced and starred in the Slam Dance Jury Prize film Phantom Pain, and co-starred opposite Teresa Russell in the feature film Moving Mountains. Tina wrote and performed her second critically praised solo show, Secrets of a Holy Father. We'll definitely touch on that as well. Off-Broadway, playing her father, Sir John. Tina's writing's been featured in numerous publications, including Psychology Today, Best Self Magazine, and The Baltimore Sun that was a whole lot of mouthful, Tina. I am. <laughs> I'm sorry. Someone should have sent you a shorter bio. <laughs> I am. No, that's am, that's amazing. The number of things that you have going on right now. Thank you. Thank you for oh, thank taking you. time to sit with me today. And I think where I want to start is uh, tell us a little bit about your memoir about hiding out because that is really. I, you and I have already chatted a little bit. I finished listening to it on, go get it on Audible, everybody, audience, go get it on Audible. It's not just a book. It's an experience. It's like an immersive experience. So talk, talk about hiding out. Well, I just want to add to that, that I really enjoyed reading it um, for Audible. Um, It, you know, I had written it, of course, um, and I didn't necessarily write it for a cathartic experience because uh, although it is, you know, obviously a memoir and very, um, 
raw material um, about me being the youngest of 13 and my father, who was maybe one of the most, um, you know, Catholic, holiest uh, men you've ever met kind of guy, uh, came out to me um, in my late teens and uh, suspected that I had been at the time in a relationship with a woman, which was true. And when he sort of put those pieces together, he decided to confide in me that he had been living a double life. And uh, we kept it a secret from my family. And then I had what then was sort of a transformational experience with him, which was basically going from a, a man I really didn't like, wasn't really a, a great dad in terms of his emotional availability. He was a great provider mm -hmm. um, and taught us a lot about the world, but he wasn't quite there. Um, and kind of scary too, uh, with his drinking and, and raging. But then I came to love him because I came to see this other man that I never knew. And of course he had been hiding um, from us and the rest of the world in many ways. So that's the journey of hiding out. And um, and in, in just wanted to add that when I read the book, it felt so freeing. Like I had already written it. So it was surprising to me that when I actually got into a booth and read it, it was actually enjoyable. Um, something about just visiting. I did have to stop a couple times in the booth mm -hmm. with some tears. So that didn't <laughs> translate too much and get in the way of the reading. But yeah, thank you for listening to it. I'm glad you ha I got to experience it. And experience is exactly the right word because it's not only, it, it's not just about the narrative. It's not just about the story that you're telling, which is a compelling, fascinating, upsetting, hard story to yeah. listen to sometimes. But you, you as an actor, just absolutely it, it's alive. I mean, it's, it's mm, so alive all the way through and yeah, I, I don't know what, uh, your dad, what Sir John actually sounded like, like but that. like that. <laughs> yeah. Like that. Yeah. Pretty much like that. Um, you know, I played him off Broadway as you read in the bio, uh, and spent many years developing, him as a character in the sense of taking him on and really felt kind of otherworldly in that process, like really transformed. I am a character actress already, but to play my dad in that way and really get lost in him felt like a full, like, you know, internal and external transformation. So by the time I got to reading him in the book, I had already done all that. So I think I can safely say you heard my heard dad. Your dad. And yeah. I heard, and I heard you too. So, yeah. you know, if you're listening in uh, to us on, on Apple podcasts or podcasts, you're not going to see Tina and the distinction between who you are today, who I'm seeing now yeah. on the screen and the voice of the teenage you. Yeah. Yeah. The voice of Christine. Yeah. Um, the, the, the anger and the p panic and the anxiety mm -hmm. and the like uh, exhilaration, like all, all of these different things are just so present in your voice and in the way that you yeah. act. So, Thank you. yeah. 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 What do you think? So now we're going to dive into it, kind of a deeper question. What, yeah. what do you think the impact of living in secrecy and with it protecting other secrets had on you? Because it's not just a story about your father living a secret life or a double life. No. Yeah. 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 No, I, you know, I was keeping secrets um, since I was a little girl, um, you know, a little bit of, um, um, I guess, um, disclaimer is that there is those parts in the book which i don't dwell on but it is important for context to know that i was abused by um, a couple family members when i was quite young so that was already a huge secret that i was managing and keeping um, as a young girl 
Um, then my own, um, then I had a, <laughs> then I forgot something kind of important. <laughs> I was going to skip over it. Um, that then that led to me having a secret relationship with my seventh grade teacher who happened to be a woman. And then that was a secret to keep literally in the classroom. If you can imagine being in seventh grade in your home with teacher, you're having a full blown affair with, um, could be quite complicated and, um, mind blowing. Um, I had already been through what I had been through with the family members. So obviously I was operating, you know, at 300 and I don't know, 200 miles an hour, um, already. And so then there was this, and then that of course led to, um, you know, into my teens with my dad and that revelation, and then sort of going on this wild ride with him that include clubs and partying and world travel and, um, girlfriends and including all of that in the mix. So I lived a pretty fast life, you know, um, from the time I was a kid um, of sex, drugs, maybe not rock and roll, but um, <laughs> pretty much everything else. So it impacted me hugely. I was totally shut down emotionally, functioning highly. Thank God for basketball that I had a physical outlet because I think that probably saved my life in many ways because, you know, we all know what endorphins can do and also just the physical relief, release of some of that rage and angst uh, on a pretty much daily basis because I was a pretty big athlete um, was probably really helpful. But I was totally shut, shut down. And by the time I was in my 20s, I think I almost was like um, – you know, I had a first acting coach, um, not Susan, but a woman named Sandra Seacat, who's just passed this year, but also sort of a big coach to the stars, but through dream work and literally your dreams. And she helped me heal a lot, as did Susan in those early years. But I remember in my first workshop with her, she said, uh, after the end of it, like a six week thing, she said, everybody turn around and look at Tina's face. Mm -hmm. She said, you remember when she walked in, how it was like a mask? Look how it's kind of like so open now. And just in that short time of some healing work and some permission to get a lot of feelings out, the, the mask I had been wearing started to crack. And it's taken a long time to have this face <laughs> that's free to laugh and, you know, be silly and irreverent uh, about my past. But yeah, it's been a long journey. Yeah. But a good one. Thank you. And I, I start to get that sense uh, from listening to the book and from who you've kind of emerged into. Yeah. What is, what would you say? I want to go out a level from that. So you're, yeah. you're going around, you went through this whole early traumatic set of experiences in your life and and you were also fully engaged. Like you, you weren't a, you weren't asleep. You were just hidden. Yes, exactly. I was out with what I had, but I was, you know, shut down with what I didn't want anyone to right. know. What do you think that means to us as a society when you have a, a fascinating and unique story and? I have a fascinating and unique story and the person next door to me has a fascinating, what does it mean to us as a society that this is the kind of, we reproduce this, we reproduce secrets and we reproduce this kind of traumatic context for all of us. Well, I think that there's a lot of pain um, that people aren't dealing with in a um, loving uh, productive way because it's not safe in many cases to break family legacy and it's not safe to be vulnerable and I think that's why I love what you're doing at the Mankind Project so much um, as we all know who any of us who've read a self-help book hurt people hurt people we've all heard that uh, and I'm sure my family members who hurt me were hurt which is part of the reason I'm actually doing um, the short film that you referenced um, in many ways for that reason. 
uh, to explore the man's side of it when they get hurt uh, or a man's side of it. So I just feel that for me, my the way that I could maybe help change the legacy and make a difference where I don't see it always in society is to come clean about my own behavior. So as you reference, you know, yeah, it's my dad's story, but it's my story. One of the things that was really important to me with writing Hiding Out was to really expose my bad behavior, which you, you've heard. <laughs> you know that for a fact. And I had a lot of bad behavior. I, I repeated what was done to me in many ways. And when we can come clean with that, I think we have a chance to break legacy, to change our own life, and then start to have impact and give people permission, which was really my goal for the book. It wasn't to necessarily heal myself, but was to give other people permission to say, look, she she really acted poorly and crazy and destructive and at times ugly and messy. And she got to the other side of it, it seems. Maybe I can admit what I did or what happened to me. And then we have a chance to start to change this societal thing about secrets and shame. Thank you. Yeah, that's very well said. And what has that looked like for you? If you can think of a story, how has your experience and your coming forward opened up possibilities for other people? Um, two things quickly come to mind. One was just very recently. My book came out a couple of years ago, but um, I just got a direct message through Instagram uh, from someone I didn't know who said something like, I'm sure you're never going to read this. You probably get thousands of these a day, <laughs> which I don't, but that was nice of her to say. <laughs> um, your book allowed me to open up about, you know, the abuse that had happened to me is, is essentially what she said. Um, and I had an experience with an actor that I had worked with um, as well, a, a guy who I had worked with on a film many years ago who read my book and reached out at the time, it, it, closer to when it came out, who said to me, I've not even told my wife, but I had an experience like yours, um, uh, an abuse that had happened to him by a man in this case. Um, and I've never told anyone. And like, I was literally the first person he told. And just creating that space, you know, holding the space, as you well know, with your own work, to hold the space for someone. And my book was just an attempt to hold space for people to step in if there was a secret that they'd been keeping. It didn't have to be about abuse. It could be many things. But to free up some space to not be carrying that baggage the rest of your life, like it already happened. And to keep carrying the baggage is kind of almost self-abusive at that point. It's not that we did the original abuse, but it is kind of abusive to ourselves to keep carrying somebody else's shame and bad behavior or even our own because it's over. Yes. Uh, what I want listeners to know is just the emotion that I'm witnessing on Tina's face as she's speaking <laughs> and to just see see the connection as soon as i started to answer uh, ask the last question tina's face changed and i could see the emotion <laughs> in her face come yeah. forward so, yeah thank yeah. you for that and yeah and it also gave me so this the story and your story the other thing that it really made clear to me is uh how much easier it is for me and I judge for lots of other people to have compassion for the dysfunctional things that we see to have empathy and to have compassion and to have create a new level of understanding for things that I would judge and call dysfunctional and call really unhealthy behaviors and call all of these things. And that was for you and for Sir John. It's like, you pulled yeah he's not an easy guy to to have empathy for you know he he didn't just have secrets he he actually uh was very, caused a lot of pain and was was really just hurtful because 
of course he was releasing on us, us being my siblings and my yes. mother, all of his pain and rage and the things that he didn't feel safe to um, reveal and live, um, you know, the life that maybe he, he would have preferred to live or, um, you know, I'm sure as a, as a staunch Catholic, doing that and being that uh, was very complicated. And he had to probably compartmentalize a lot. But we got the, you know, the, the short end of that stick a lot in terms of his rage. But, but you're right. And, 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 you know, in kind of a night, you know, like in, in a 24 hour period, I went from like, kind of hating my dad to, you know, seeing that, you know, the emperor had no clothes, mm. you know, it was that kind of shocking thing, like, that's him. So uh, I didn't come to compassion or um, forgiveness, you know, right away, I just got on the merry go round, or maybe better, better said the roller coaster with him, and took a really wild ride. Um, but prior to that, I would never even have gotten on a roller coaster with him because he was too scary. Yes. And the roller coaster is very much in the book. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, fasten your seatbelt. Yes. Um, how do you feel about forgiveness today? Talk about forgiveness. It's a, it's a huge, it's a huge topic. Yeah. Yes, it is. It's, it's, um, you know, there, there's that idea again, that's quite common that we've, we've all heard that, you know, when you forgive someone, um, you, you're certainly not condoning behaviors, uh, or situations, um, and that you're really doing it for yourself. Um, because it's not like we have the power to absolve someone or, uh, we're, we're better than them or bigger than them, or, you know, you know, we're just not, but what it does do is stop eventually all the tension and anxiety and mental, um, somersaults about blame from the past that I know I was caught up in and it's painful and it's like, they're not that person is not getting any of that um, angst. It's all happening inside of us. So it really is true that forgiveness is for us because it stops the, you know, internal angst eventually. It's not an overnight pill to take that just makes it, you know, wipe out. It's, it's a process of two steps forward and one step back or vice versa for some. Um, but yeah, I think forgiveness is everything. It's, it's the thing that's allowed me to move forward in my life. And it's not to say I can't access the rage, certainly as an actor yeah. and otherwise that could come up in remembering the specifics of what happened to me as a child, but it's not making me, um, live a free and full life by staying in it. So it's a selfish act but it's the right kind of selfishness to forgive someone. That's thank you. Selfishness as uh, selfishness gets a bad rap, right? <laughs> like yeah. there, there are ways in yeah. which are healing. Yeah. Continue. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, uh, it reminds me of a, of a wonderful um, teacher uh, that I've heard often say about selfishness, that um, this idea that, People call you selfish when you do something for yourself, and then she often will, you know, um, you know, get the context of that as, but you don't, meaning the other person, but you, you're not being selfish by wanting me to do what you want, you know. So it's like who's who's being selfish, you know? Taking care of oneself is really important. I think that's what society needs most right now, in my humble opinion people to really get it's not a selfish oh it's about me and ego and social media and all the superficial self right. it's about self-care that we're really missing thank you yes yeah i know you know that from your work <laughs> yeah. i can only imagine because you know, i know you've you've talked about 
the men's groups and the different things that you guys facilitate at the, the Mankind Project. And I can only imagine, um, you know, what what goes on there in terms of all of that, like teaching men to take care of them, you know, their hearts and their souls. The, yes, and I don't think that there is... There are social distinctions between how men and women embody this stuff, right? Yeah. And social distinctions in, in what we're taught about what we're supposed to do with it. Yeah. And the energetic, like I'll just throw in the energetic, it takes so much energy to maintain the masks and it takes so much energy to maintain the kind of lockdown on our emotions yeah. that it's absolutely exhausting, right? We meant what I yeah. see over and over in working with men is that when they finally recognize that they can actually crack the shell into their vulnerability mm -hmm. and release that and feel safe enough and trusting enough within a, you know, a container and you know yeah. what a container feels like um, to do that, that the amount of energy that they get back toward caring for themselves and caring for the people that they love and the access to them that the people that they love get, it's just completely liberating, right? It's, it's just changes. Yeah. Yeah. And what you have to give changes profoundly. Yes. You know, what you're able to give when you take care of your, your, your heart and your soul changes dramatically um, because you're, you're generally okay because you've, you've, you know, put your own oxygen mask on first. And it's way easier to be generous and helpful and easy about giving when you've done that. Let's talk about drugs. Let's. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> um, this is another, you know, thread that runs through the book, but it's also another way that I see in our work with men, like all the myriad ways that, we numb ourselves out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, God, that's such a big one. And it's so, gosh, it's so at the heart too, right? Of, um, you know, our culture. Um, when I started acting at about 30, well, first of all, for those obviously who haven't read my book or know my story, um, I was a big partier. You know, much of my... Um, pain got, um, you know, swallowed up uh, in acting out with drugs and alcohol, partying, you know, till I was, you know, I don't know, blacked out, but definitely blitzed and, mm -hmm. and you know, on, on in, a, in a bad space. And, and somehow I was, you know, I was functioning. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't do it nonstop because I did have a basketball right. career, so to speak. But it, it was a way that I checked out, that's for sure. When I started acting, I didn't quit drinking, but I started to realize when I would go to acting class with Susan Batson, I'd go almost every day. I quit a, quit my job, you know, in, in New York. Uh, I was an executive, and I just threw, kind of walked away from it all because I knew I had to deal with my feelings mm. and my life, mm. um, which is why I left that career. I just knew that there was something more for me, something I had to do. And it was kind of a break, even though it wasn't a f official mental break. Anyway, I would go to acting class and I would, I started to notice that the access to my emotional life, which is a big part of Susan's work, you know, at 10 o'clock in the morning was different when I went to class and I hadn't had anything to drink the night before versus even having one or two glasses of wine. So it wasn't like being hung over. It was even the smallest. So I started to get sensitive to myself. Mm. And that's actually what really changed my drinking is that I really was getting kind of turned on with the idea, of, A, of being an actor, which was shocking at almost 30 <laughs> to be doing that yeah. and a bit crazy. Um, but also I was starting to see what it was like to experience myself. And I didn't want to mess with that so much i wanted to see what was there so that's what stopped and then my partner got sober many years later um not that many years later really um 
And so then I, after a few years of, you know, you know drinking much less, I thought, you know what, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to drink anymore either. I didn't go to any program or anything, but I was just like, I don't need this, you know? So I actually stopped drinking for almost maybe 15 to 18 years, uh, you know, pretty much non. I, I didn't drink at all during that time. And, you know, every so often now, like maybe a couple times a year, Christmas or whatever, I might have a glass. But even then, you know, it's like, there's a difference. And when you really are drinking consistently, you're not able to access, you might think you're fine, but you're not really accessing. There's a, there's a filter. We're all the same. So it's not like I have one and you don't. It's like, it's a, it's a bit of a filter. And I feel it even today. If I have a glass of wine the next day, I'm like, I'm fine. I can do anything pretty much I need to do. But there's a little filter over me, and I don't like that. It's I'm a little addicted to not having filters anymore. Yeah, very well said. That yeah. the subtle shifts, yeah. and again, as a culture, I think that we fool ourselves. Right? We fool ourselves yeah. to thinking that this is a social lubricant when it's actually a, a social. It's a filter. It's a it change. Yeah. yeah. And and I had this incredible aha back then which was, you know, this great thing happened to me, you know, so I was in, I was acting and whatever, and maybe I got an audition or I got a call back or I got a little job in the early years. And I was so excited. And my first reaction would be, let's go celebrate, mm. which meant drinking. And then I had this aha after a bit, which was alcohol is a depressant. Mm. Like that's a fact, right? So if I'm going to go celebrate, why am I taking a depressant? Because we all know the first glass feels nice and it's relaxing and it's, it's fun. But then I started to notice if I was at a party and everyone else was drinking by like 11 o'clock, I had so much energy and I was just still talking the same way I was when I walked in and full of energy and everyone else is like, I'm going to go home now. I'm tired. You want to go get something to eat, a hamburger? <laughs> So, you know, I'm not here to bash, you know, no one should drink. But I did find it interesting that we choose a depressant as a culture to celebrate. Mm. Not even an upper, but a downer. Interesting. Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it's a, it's a, I'm thinking about Sir John now, that yeah. it, it also becomes a way of, uh, divorcing ourselves from responsibility. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And in your behavior as a, as a, a young person and in my behavior as a young person, and certainly like that was one of the things is like, I know if I do this, yeah. then in some way I'm going to like be able to let myself off the hook for all of the really poor executive thinking, <laughs> the executive yes. choice making. Did you keep secrets as a young, as a young man, a young boy? Good God, of yes. Any... Yeah. yeah. And that, yeah. Uh, listening to your story brought lots of, brought lots of things back for me. And, and the idea I'm also from not a big family like yours and also not a Catholic family like yours but a fairly good sized family. So I have, I grew up with five brothers. I have six brothers. There was a wow. lot of, it was the opposite story of yours in terms of your parents, largely, you know, your parents were together for that. Yeah. My parents divorced in 80 or 81 and then both remarried and then both divorced again and then both remarried again. And then my dad divorced again yeah. and my dad remarried. So like this, all of this chaos, but I not only started maintaining my own kind of double life, secret life as an 11 year old, 12 year old, 13 year old kid, yeah. but it was a similar kind of thing in that I'm going to keep your secrets for you too. Yeah. I'm going to pr protect the family mm -hmm. from our own dysfunction, yeah. you know, by putting on masks and putting on behaviors and putting on all of these things that are going to make it seem like 
if you had asked my teachers or school administrators or whoever else was out there, they would, oh, Boysen is just a wonderfully behaved, so polite, <laughs> such a, you know, such a nice young man, all of this stuff. When like underneath that is like, Bleh. yeah, 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 I could charm too. I didn't necessarily get great um, feedback from, from the nuns in terms of my behavior. <laughs> I was acting out in school too i was kind of the ringleader they called me so uh -huh. i was i was that kid but um but yeah but i could i could charm and make it seem to adults like i really had my shit together yes <laughs> that's you know you do learn that when you're keeping secrets you you learn to wear a, a lot of different kinds of masks and we are very kindly using the word charm when what we're actually saying is that we learn to manipulate other people manipulate, very effectively exactly. <laughs> exactly exactly yeah yeah i yeah, resonated with exactly that exactly what it is resonated with that a lot <laughs> and um i said that i told you before we got on that i would share a little bit one of the other things that just uh, came out in my family much later, but my grandparents, my mother's parents divorced at some mm -hmm. point, And it only came out years and years later that my grandfather was gay. Really? And wow. And that's why they divorced. Would you assume? Uh, there's a, there's or a wider story around that. There's some other things around that actually having to do with my dad. And when my dad entered the picture of my mom's life uh -huh. and, um, my grandfather was a concert pianist. My, my grandmother was a concert violinist. She was a first chair violinist wow. and they were both child prodigies and they met when met and married when they were very young and they lived in multiple different locations with universities where my grandfather would teach composition and teach piano. And my grandmother would teach, teach violin and wow. all the time um, in the meantime, he would be having affairs with students primarily wow. like my dad well not with students necessarily but Diff yeah diff different <laughs> but and it yeah. so li hmm, listening to your story actually helped me connect with this line of history in my own family in a different mm. way because we always mm. be like why did grandpa disappear later in life? Like he wasn't mm -hmm. present anywhere. He wasn't, he just kind of disappeared from the family and he drank wow. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And it yep. just kind of puts, yeah. So I thank you for yeah, that. Very similar. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Interesting. It, Funny. My, um, the, one of the projects you mentioned, uh, that I'm currently working on, uh, just finished writing actually, um, the one I ref you referenced is the 1960s segregated Baltimore, about two sisters. Mm -hmm. One of them is a child prodigy, the young 11 year old. Uh, there's two, it's a story of two sisters in Baltimore at that time. And one of them is um, a pianist, a child prodigy. So it's in the air. I like that. Thank you. Yeah, that's beautiful. What's it like to not have all the answers about? who your who sir john was yeah um i think i i think i've you know i certainly feel at peace with it um sometimes i wonder you know with some of my siblings um if that still feels difficult i think it does based on a few of their reactions to me writing the book and and being so forthright about my experience with him, which of course was very different from their experience with him. But um, yeah, I feel fine about it. I mean, I, I guess because I put in a lot of legwork to try to find out mm -hmm. and what I kept bumping up against, particularly with his connections to the Vatican. Um, not too much spoiler alert on that one, but he did have very high level connections at the Vatican. And I did a lot of, as I talk about in the epilogue, a lot of um, interviewing and asking. And and what I was left with was kind of what is generally left with um, in all cases with the Catholic Church, which is you're not going to get what they don't want you to know. Mm. <laughs> so, so for today, and even the popes that my dad had um, 
connection, you know, connections with, you know, their papacies. Those records, if they even existed, mm. are not released until I think almost 70 years after a pope passes. So, for example, all the paperwork uh, from Francis won't ever be seen or allowed for, say, scholars to go into the Vatican archives and look at any of that till at least I'm, get, I'm just I'm, it's about 70 years. It might be 80 after he passes. So my dad, you know, he's you know passed uh, probably about seven years ago, ten years ago, maybe now. Um, you know, all that stuff wouldn't be accessible for me through the Vatican archives, even if he was there, even if they mentioned him. But why would they mention him? That that would be. But there are enough facts that make it clear to me, plus his own admission and other things that are in the book that you'll hear or read if you choose, um, that makes it very clear that he had some a double life there too. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. <laughs> but I'm cool with it. I, I, you know, I'd like to know more, but so many of those people have gone. Yeah. And many of them were very tight-lipped. So I did speak to a cardinal in private, uh, I think it was at the Park Lane, which is now a different hotel in New York, but literally on Central Park West, went to the penthouse. Somebody, you know, felt like one of those, uh, you know, meetings out of something that would happen, you know, at cloak and dagger at a very high level of the White House or <laughs> yeah. something. You know, it's like secret meeting. Went to the penthouse and a cardinal, uh, a foreign from a foreign country, who was very on the short list to be pope during. Pope Fran when Pope Francis was um, elected in the conclave. He was, you know, on the short list. Anyway, I had a conversation with him in this penthouse uh, on Central Park West about my dad, and um, he didn't know him, but he certainly nodded, and that was the highest level person I got to. Mm -hmm. uh, but he nodded to the fact that the Vatican had a lot of um, people lay people working for them in secret so fascinating yeah, yeah. and your book's going to be made into a movie hopefully so i am very much in the process now um uh, of development and um we're moving along and i for a while we thought it was going to be a tv series um even though when you read it you'll be like this is a book i mean this is a film and um, I think that's, I think it's landing where it's supposed to. I think it's a film too. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's not in the book that could make a series. Yeah. It could go on and on, right. like a Six Feet Under or Modern Family, but, you know, on... Uh, Catholic. On, um, that, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. The very Catholic, you know, Modern Family. Right. Um, but um, yeah, that's where it's at now. We're in development on it. Let's shift a little bit to talk about the men's room, which was the yeah. actual reason that you connected with me. So talk about yes. that, about that project. Yeah. Well, um, for many of the things that I've already said, uh, many of the reasons I felt after the me too movement, which is kind of when my book came out, just coincidentally, um, I, I started to, you know, I was directing things. I had another project that had to do with uh, a Me Too story, um, a play, actually, and we had a lot of talkbacks. And I started to realize that, well, there's huge amount of feelings being had by men in general, just because Me Too was like a tidal wave of like, all your bad behavior can never happen again, mm. <laughs> you know, and for good reason. And but it did feel, I think, too many guys just from the little bit I was, you know, hearing and discussing in these kinds of situations, um, that it felt like a tidal wave and that I felt there was something deeper going on that might need to be talked about because of my own history and my own reference where we started today about hurt people hurt people. Yeah. It's like, well, what's going on with the guys? Like, if we want this big societal change where we're more of a heart-centered culture, yes. 
which is definitely, we, we are in dire need of that in America right now um, on both sides. How does that happen if you're not really giving men the opportunity to have their feelings? And I don't mean like, you know, someone's put them in a box, but I also mean we've kind of put men in a box or men yes. have put themselves in a box. I, you know, I don't yes. know. It's not really one thing or the other. But it's, you know, it, it is real. And so now we have things like, you know, stay at home dads that are not, it's not an unusual thing, but that used to be, that would have been like an, an unheard of. Right. And if you're a stay at home dad, I imagine you're really connecting to your kids and you're having lots more time to be heart centered than if you're at the office, which traditionally was the roles. But just in a day-to-day -day thing, I think men don't t typically, or they're not encouraged to take space for that or have space for that. And I just got that over the course of finishing my book, doing a book tour, directing a play that involved the same subject matter, and sort of going through the Me Too experience like everyone else, yes. um, and having a lot of conversations. And I thought, I'd like to tell a male Me Too story which is what the, what, what's at the heart of the men's room, which is a mother-son story set in Hollywood. And she, me, playing the actress, is in dire need of a comeback. And the grown but young son, he's in his 20s, is in dire near, need of a mother mm. <laughs> and mm. maybe a therapist and maybe someone to tell his secret. So he's carried this secret. Um, but the twist is that the person who's going to essentially give my character, the actress, the comeback role of her life happens to also be the perpetrator of her son. And so there we have the rub. And I wanted to explore that. And then you and um, your colleagues have also been so helpful in sort of consulting with me on, you know, the man's point of view, the male point of view and also how important it is for men to have allies so that they can take some risks. And so that was very helpful because I even adjusted the script um, to reflect a man who's already was already in the story to really be this young man's ally mm -hmm. in a subtle but clear way to show how important that is. So it's been a long journey, but getting back to sort of forgiveness, I think forgiveness led me to this point in time in where I have the bandwidth and the space to focus on maybe a bigger issue at hand because my stuff is, yeah, pretty well cleaned up and I don't need to keep telling my story or explored in a solo show or a book um, or anything else. It's kind of feels like the next phase and the next place that me could use some attention for the big picture, which I was affected mm -hmm. by. Um, and also, you know, my brothers had their own experience. I don't know all of it, but I certainly know enough men that have had experiences. We went through the Catholic Church priest clergy crisis. Um, so we know there are a lot of Catholic men who have had really unfortunate experiences with men. Um, and ironically, one of the people who I'm collaborating with in the development, we're hoping to shoot this the end of June, mm. um, just not coincidentally, but coincidentally, one of my collaborators on the project, one of my crew members, has had similar experience, not just, he had it twice, once with a man and once with a woman. Um, and so it's not a man's issue and it's not a women's issue, it's everybody. And if we could hold it like that, we'd get out of this, you know, us versus them space, which is, I guess, what I'm, my big picture thing is to give men and women more opportunity to talk about this freely in a sane and respectful way with each other. Thank you. Which necessitates each of us. 
being really willing to lean in to our own work. Right. Yeah. Cause no one's just going to raise their hand, but if they read something or see something, watch a movie, read a book, see a story on television and all of a sudden their heart bursts open and they're like, Oh, I see myself. Then they, then they have the chance to lean in where without talking about this, without artists and um, creatives bringing story, um, I think a lot of people don't get that first crack open. And then it's up to us as individuals to lean in. Like nobody can make you lean in. No one can make you want to heal. But we can help, you know, by, by mirroring our stuff back to you or your stuff back to you, I should say. I think there's a, thank you. There's a wonderful little segue there into you shifted your entire career and went into acting. You're telling <laughs> me two stories within the acting world. There's a whole lot of complicating factors about power and power dynamics and the role of women in Hollywood and yeah. aging and all of these things. What, is are there hopeful signs are there things that you point to in the industry these days and say wow that's good that this is happening this way yeah i mean i think actually the me too movement in and of itself is was very important for hollywood i mean if you just know the smallest bit about harvey weinstein he became the poster boy of the most horrid parts of hollywood and that too, we learn today, as we've moved away from Mr. Weinstein, we get uh, Brendan Fraser's story. Right. Um, we get Adam Rapp's story right. with Kevin Spacey. We get, and at the very least, you know, um, inappropriate behaviors. Um, I'm going to speak to two male actors next week um, who have offered to talk with me about their own experiences. Uh, and it's so it happens on all sides of, you know, the casting couch, of course, historically was about women. But I don't know, truthfully, if it's always been about women. I mean, I think the casting couch existed for men a long time ago, too, as it does today. Um, the great thing about Me Too is things like intimacy coordinators, right. which now at least there's someone there if you want to talk about it. I mean, yes, there is the argument, well, it's kind of in the way of like an organic spark that actually does need to happen sometimes, but you also want to feel safe. So these safety measures feel important. And I think more than anything is people aren't as afraid to say it happened to me. I think guys still more so than women but I feel like the Brendan Fraser story, if you don't know it, you can just Google. Um, and he was a young, he was an adult. Um, and it really had a, seemed to have a very big impact on him. And then he was kind of blacklisted when he did speak up. So that's a big tale in and of itself. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I think there are hopeful changes. And I think women too, you know, a little more diversity happening um in all areas of of hollywood um that that seems to to be a, a bit more of a priority for everyone across the board and that's great thank you yeah that yes well said there's so much about power in there the the idea of the story of ca casting couches and who's who's yes. held the primary positions of power in the industry for so long yes. so of course yeah. the way that that abuse is the perpetration is going to flow kind of that's right this is how it's showing up but yes thank you for talking yeah. about brendan fraser and that and yeah. that story yeah. yeah and tarana burke so originator of the kind of hashtag me too spoke about and this was even back 2019 probably 2020 when tarana burke spoke about this is the shift from we have to move move the dial. It was never intended to be a way of attacking and destroying people. The movement was originated as a way for people who had been victimized to speak up and own their story. Yeah. 
and yeah. be in the healing process. Yep. So I, I feel heartened by hearing you and hearing how the industry is kind of shifting, that we're moving maybe away from enemies and evil and this kind of polar, extraordinarily polarized yes. conversation into how yeah. do we all take responsibility for this? I think that's, uh, that's such a great point you make. I think that we are, we're a, a society um, that is, as we all know, very polarized. And I think as people in our society today, we're sort of encouraged to, to dig our heels in and take a side. And what that does, in my opinion, is it really does uh, prevent responsibility. I think it's the antidote to self-responsibility mm -hmm. because it's easy for me to not take any responsibility when I'm pointing my fingers at you, you know, pointing my finger. But there's that expression, when I point my finger at you, they're three pointing back at me. And I think people need to take that to heart because it's not about, you know, the me too in terms of like, of course people who have been abused, myself included, need the space and time to be angry. Yes, yes first to speak out, they have the right to say what they need to say. Um, the idea isn't to stay there, but that doesn't sort of give this blanket permission to just go, you are the problem. You know, I have no responsibility because you are the problem. You know, we see it in politics. We see it in Hollywood. We see it in the diversity conversation. People wanting to make other people their problem you know, from gay people to drag queens to uh, if we don't say the word, if we don't read the book, if we don't show them the picture, it'll never be an issue. And it's so silly and so counterproductive because it, it really, where's your responsibility in that if I'm your problem? Mm. <laughs> you know, yes. that seems kind of crazy to me. But so I think you're right, uh, Boyce, and I think responsibility is, kind of one of the biggest factors in all of this. Thank you. So moving into uh, my f final question, and it's kind of a, a little yeah. bit too partish. What's, what's something that you love about men and you'd like to see them embody even more in the world? Oh, that's so good. Um, I think you know, I'm, I like, um, I like men with manners and I like men that are gracious and I don't mind someone holding the door for me. And I think that men having good manners and being in their authentic power is really sexy. And I think I, I think men, I would hope uh, if I could wave a wand that I would say, there's no shame in that, but you don't have to dominate me to be sexy. You know, like you, you can be strong and just be in your authentic masculinity. I find that I find that I'm, you know, I, I'm with a woman, but I find that sexy. I've been with men. I find that very sexy authentic masculinity it's lovely thank you um it so yeah and now so same question but what's something that you love about women and you would like to see them embody even more in the world god it's almost um you know it's it's almost the same answer obviously it's not their masculine power but but their their feminine strength which again is not the cliche in the same way I said it about the masculine seeming like that means dominance for women, their, their, um, femininity as a, um, symbol of strength as opposed to submission or weakness or passivity but actually both of those can move forward um, in a very, you know, kind of heart centered way, but from strength. So I think women have a lot of strength mm -hmm. when they own their authentic femininity, as opposed to some 
idea of what feminine is. And you will feel that viscerally if you read Hiding Out as well. <laughs> that, yes. Yeah. Uh, that, <laughs> Strength, yes, absolute strength. So I celebrate, celebrate your strength, and your Thank healing you, journey, and your uh, power. Yeah. I... Thank you so much. Thank you so so much. This has been an incredible, incredible time. And I hope when um, the men's room is uh, finished uh, filming and ready, that um, we'll get to share it with you and. Uh, any of the men in your um, beautiful organization and, um, you know, that, that want to watch it and just be a starting point for a conversation about, you know, um, dominance, submission, you know, freedom and uh, intimacy. Lovely. Where uh, should folks go to learn more about you and what you're up to and how should they follow you? Yeah. Um, so I I am on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Um, and I'm my handle is at Tina Alexis Allen. Um, and as far as the men's room, if anyone's interested in engaging with us, uh, we are um, uh, we have a fully tax deductible um, donation page at Fractured Atlas. You can just go to Fractured Atlas and type in the men's room uh, and you can read more. And I did a video so you can learn more about the story and what we're up to. And so that's that's that. And then hiding out, you know, all of your options if you'd like to read it on Amazon or any other place that sells books and uh, audio is audible, as Boyson said. Thank you so much. Tina Alexis Allen for hanging out with me for an hour and having wow. this conversation. All of the links uh, that Tina just mentioned will be in the show notes down below at Tina Alexis Allen on Instagram. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank, thank you so much, Boyson. Okay. This has been the Mankind Podcast produced in association with the Mankind Project USA. I have been your host, Brandon Clift, and I personally want to thank our guests for joining us today and imparting their wisdom from their experiences in this amazing journey called life. Now, the fee for this episode is simple. If you found gold and insights that you believe could benefit your loved ones and those you care about, be sure to share it with them. And of course, remember that life doesn't happen to us. It happens for us. So long as we rip the pen out of fate's hand and become the author of our own story. So my friend, pick up the pen and we'll see you next week. Lots of love.